Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Uh, uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, so just a quick uh, introduction to, uh, to myself. Uh, I, I, I'm the VP of engineering here at Harness, and I sort of help them build uh, many parts of the software delivery platform. Uh, prior to this, I spent uh, most of my career building infrastructure, uh, both at VMware and uh, Nutanix. Uh, so I was part of the, uh, the team that actually built virtualization. Uh, at uh, VMware, and we sort of took that a notch above at Nutanix. Uh, but today we are uh, going to talk about uh, engineering efficiency at scale, which is what do you need to look at when you really want to uh, achieve your business objectives as an engineering organization, and how do you do it at scale, right? How does Dora Metrics fit into this? What else do you need to look into this? Okay, so uh, one thing I want to straight out, uh, straight away put out is. Uh, this, I want to make this interactive. So please feel free to ask questions at any point in time uh, by posting in the Q&A box. And after every couple of slides, I'll sort of, sort of take a look and you know, see if I can live answer those questions. Okay, uh, <clears throat> great. So let's get started. So uh, uh, straight away, what are the Dora metrics, right? And why do, uh, why do we care about it? And what are the caveats you really, really need to think about? So the Dora metrics uh, really just tell you uh, what is your ability to ship change or a set of changes to your customer and how do you do it without breaking things, right? That's what they really try to help you measure. And if you do it, it sort of help you highlight where the problem is, okay? But what they don't tell you is, uh, is effectively whether they, you are achieving your business goals. And so that's something we will, uh, we will uh, touch upon in a little bit, okay? The one other thing a lot of people miss with Dora Metrics is that this just does not apply to your services that you're hosting. This actually applies to your tool stack as well, specifically your DevOps tool stack. Because if you do not have the ability to make changes quickly and in a reliable manner, uh, you pretty much are, uh, it's as bad as your services not uh, meeting the Dora metrics as well, right? Uh, the, sec uh, the other thing I'll also point out is uh, excellent tooling is very important to, uh, again, uh, you know, do, do very well with respect to Dora metrics, uh, but culture is also really important. And what you need to do is you need to use your tooling to sort of embed the culture into it. And in fact, I'll show, give you guys a few examples of how we do it at Harness. So that uh, gives you more insights into this process. Okay. So um, I, I think most of you should be familiar with Dora metrics. If not, I will just uh, go over this uh, fairly quickly here on the slide. So there's four key Dora metrics. The first is deployment frequency. This sort of uh, informs someone um, what is, uh, you know, what, what's basically their ability to sort of ship code on uh, and at what frequency can they do that, okay? Um, so as you can see, the top organization sort of can do it on demand any number of times a day. Uh, and over, uh, you know, for, for other organizations, it varies for, uh, between like once per day to like, you know, maybe once every few months, right? Now, just because you can doesn't mean you keep doing multiple deployments every day. Particularly for this metric, it really should be driven by your business needs. What are your customers asking for? What 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 is what is the right thing for your business? That's what determines this. Okay, um, you, uh, you just doing multiple deployments a day and you know sort of uh, uh, pushing changes that your customers don't need does, is not necessarily the right thing for a lot of people. Okay, uh, then there is the question of lead time for changes. How long does it take for you? Uh, to basically go from committing code to putting it in production, right? Uh, what, what's the amount of time it takes uh, takes for that? And this is exactly where tooling is extremely important. Uh, are you efficient in your tooling? Are they available, right? And if if we if that part is not working, I I, I think the, this time uh, this particular metric will start lagging. Okay. Um, then there is the time to restore service. If something were to go wrong, uh, right? How 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 long how long would it take for you to restore the service? As you know, in, in the modern SaaS world, especially, uh, right? I mean, we're all striving to be at least three to four nines uh, in the least. Uh, you know, the good organizations are at uh, six nines. Um, and the only way you can achieve that is, you know, you, your downtime is fairly low. Uh, you have to pretty much be in the elite, uh, uh, you know, section of uh, uh, how we measure this in order for you to actually meet anything above four nines, right? Um, and finally, there's change failure rate. How often do your deployments fail? Right. This is not, uh, in my opinion, uh, of course, it should be reasonable again, but this is again, not, there's no need to really aim for the top 
you know, the elite status here. The, the reason being, look, catching failures early is a good thing, right? Versus basically putting it in production and then realizing that something is wrong. Okay. Um, so I think what, what needs to be more encouraged is the ability to catch them rather than basically slowing down to a point where there's no failures, but then the, yeah, you're impacting your business goals, right? So the balance is really important. Here. Okay. All right. So let's uh, keep moving on. Okay. Uh, right. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about how you bake this whole process into your tooling. Right? How do you make this part of your DNA? Um, and I think we, this, is, this is an exercise we went uh, through ourselves at Harness. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that quality, security, um, and uh, the ability to verify that our deployments are working be baked into our uh, pipelines. Not only did we want to bake them into our pipelines, we wanted to mandate that there be no pipelines without these steps. Uh, so first, let's look at where they fit in. For example, in our, if you look at our, the left-hand side of the slide where we describe the continuous integration process, of course, you have the build and test, and then you generate artifacts as a result of it. But really important is basically the quality and security scanning, especially static scanning, right? You, uh, we, we, we incorporated the steps to make sure that every PR that is coming through, uh, we effectively has to pass a quality and security. Game. Otherwise, it, we don't basically generate artifacts. Let's assume it passes and then an artifact gets generated. As part of the deployment stage, now we want to make sure the artifact generated is actually secure, right? Uh, followed by some sort of uh, provisioning and uh, you know release strategy. Uh, now there's many types of release strategies you can follow. The the, the classic being rolling or canary or blue green, um, but there's now a new way also of deploying uh, code, which is uh, you know it's not a, it's important to of course you need the artifacts to go to your uh, production environment or your test environment or pre-prod. But it also is, uh, there's another way to roll out your feature, which is through a feature flag, right? So now once you put your artifacts there, you can decide how you're going to roll out your feature to your customers. Uh, you could uh, roll it out to a smaller segment based on geography, or you can roll, out, roll it out to a predetermined percentage of users. Um, now that, that really gives you a lot of flexibility, especially, uh, with uh, what we call uh, testing in production. Because uh, a lot of times as you become a large organization, you do not have the ability to replicate all of your production in uh, your staging or pre-production environments. So the only way you can really test something is in production. So you, you have, what you do before going to production is that you, uh, you make sure that you do the basic sanity testing, but then the feature itself get test, gets tested in production. Uh, finally, you, you would do a DAS security scan, right? Again, in most likely a staging or a pre-prod environment uh, before heading to production. Uh, and the last thing, and this is really important, is what we call deployment verification. Okay, uh, this is something uh, we use internally, uh, which is we monitor some key metrics. Let me give you an example: uh, page like page load time for some of our apps, right? Uh, and what we do is that. The minute you do uh, start doing the deployment, let's say you rolled out your artifacts to 20% of your uh, deployment uh, infrastructure, right? Uh, and we start measuring these metrics before and after the deployment and specifically to the 20% that actually changed, right? And let's say if your page load times are higher than they were before, clearly that's a red flag. But that means we, we, auto we initiate an automatic rollback based on that, right? If things look great, we automatically roll forward and the percentage of deployment keeps increasing until it's deployed to every, uh, you know, every node in your uh, in your infrastructure. Okay, that makes sense. Did any questions, folks, at this point before I head further? Because uh, we're going to get a little deeper in this. Okay. All right. Um, let's uh, let's keep going. Okay. Uh, now. All this is great, right? And I think uh, I would say a lot of companies actually figure out uh, how to do this at a smaller scale. Like uh, when you're like, uh, you know, a 30 people company or a 50 people company, it's fairly easy. And that's the same journey we went through at Harness. We, we basically, in the last two years, we, uh, three years, we went from like basically 50 people to 500 people. Um, and, but the key thing is how do you do all this at scale? What do you need to care about at scale? And by the way, this is the important part. I've, uh, all the software engineering organizations uh, I've been part of, almost nobody does this well. 
So it's really important that, uh, you know, we, we again, look at it, understand what the modern practices are, and also think about what matters when you're doing a software delivery at scale, right? One is the number one thing for any software organization is velocity, right? How do you make sure you keep your velocity uh, and without even at a very large scale? Right, and as probably uh, anybody in in a reasonably sized organization knows, that organizations slow down significantly as they grow. Right, so how do you keep that? Second is quality. Okay, you uh, as you're onboarding new people into the company, not everybody might be aware of what breaks things. Right, uh, <clears throat> uh, what breaks things. Okay, uh, and so we really need to uh, look at it and make sure that everybody knows how things work. And also you sort of use, that's where governance comes in, which is you need to make sure that these, uh, the quality gates or uh, whatever other things you care about are part uh, of your pipelines and hard coded in there so that nobody can override them, right? So you need this guardrails for people to not fall off, uh, fall off and sort of do something uh, that affects your quality or availability, right? Finally, you need to do all this extremely efficient. So it's great that now you have, uh, you know, uh, now you, you've sort of figured out how to do your pipelines, but what if it costs so much that the businesses, uh, you know, it's impacting how much, uh, uh, what your profit margins are, right? You really need to make sure that uh, you're optimal in how you're doing this and how do you measure that? That's also very important, okay? So there's a question on Q&A uh, from Shafali. Let me take a look. It's uh, when you're implementing at scale, what are the key metrics you start with versus enabling and showing everything at once. Uh, okay, so I think uh, the, I, I'm not sure I completely understood the question, but I, I, I really what it comes down to is the metrics are all, they're always going to be there, right? But the key ones you really want to start with is exactly the Dora metrics. That's the basic ones you want to really start with, right? And that's why those are the top ones you need to look at. The other ones I would start adding are like, for example, the efficiency metrics. That's very extremely important as well. So it's great that you have all the availability and uh, whatever else you need, uh, but what if it's costing you a lot? What if it's uh, it makes your business unviable, right? It's extremely important you look at those as well, if that answers the question. If there's a follow-up, please uh, put it in the Q&A box. Okay. Right, uh, so let's talk of value stream management a little bit here. So what does this mean? And how does this differ from the Dora metrics you just saw? Okay. What Dora metrics really helps, helps you with is understand whether you have the ability to ship code quickly and can you do it with reasonable quality, right? Well, what it does not help you understand is whether you are achieving your business objectives. Business objectives are typically defined by OKRs, right? Uh, some, I think some people use KPIs, but I think OKRs is a new gold standard in my opinion, right? Uh, and really, yeah, there's different types of OKRs, right? There's product related OKRs, which is, uh, you know, you know uh, for, for example, you might be wanting to ship a new product or you might be wanting to provide a new service, right? That, that, that's usually defined by one or more OKRs. Then there's people related OKRs. There's something like a lot of uh, organizations ignore, but at scale, it's extremely important. Are you burning out your team? Is, are, is your team happy with the work they're doing? Are they growing in their careers? How do you measure all of this? Extremely important, right? Then there is quality. How, how are your customers perceiving uh, the quality of your product or service, right? Uh, what's your uptime mean like? What's your availability mean like, right? How, how, how long do you take for, you, uh, for uh, things to get restored if something breaks, okay? Then there is cost OKRs, which is, you know, the budget for your engineering org and the associated, uh, you know, associated infrastructure and whatever else is sort of fixed. Right? It's, it's a percentage of what your company can afford uh, right? or how much money it has or is willing to spend uh, reinvesting in the business. So you need to know whether you're fitting into that budget right? and, or how you would fit, it, fit into it. Okay? Uh, finally, there's the compliance, which is depending on the industry, there's a lot of things you need to uh, take care of. For example, if you're selling to the feds, you, you need to be FedRAM compliant. If you are in the medicine business, you need to be HIPAA compliant. If you are operating in Europe, you need to be GDPR compliant. How do you make sure you're not falling, uh, uh, you know, you're not uh, breaking from that norm and sort of not being able to achieve those? Okay, so these are all different OKRs that get defined. Okay, the most important thing for people to achieve these OKRs is 
is that you need to reduce friction for your engineering team in order to help them deliver value to customers. This is absolutely the number one thing that you need to take care of. Okay. Um, and how do you do that? And I have some, uh, some, some key uh, takeaways here and I'll actually dive into each one. Number one, your tooling should always work. This is a top problem I've noticed even in my previous companies. Engineers get extremely frustrated and tooling does not work, right? It affects their efficiency. It uh, sort of undermines what uh, the mission of the organization is. And uh, more importantly, it, it really starts taking a toll on their morale uh, in terms of their ability to uh, effectively deliver, right? Uh, second is uh, remove inefficiencies. There are some obvious ones. There are not some not so obvious ones. I'll actually walk through a couple of examples in the next few slides. Right. Third, measure, measure, and look for uh, look for bottlenecks. Okay. Uh, and if you if you measure, you will always find the bottlenecks. If you don't, you won't know what is wrong. Right. It's uh, it's very important you do that. And finally, I already talked about this people related metrics. Always watch out to make sure that people in your organization are happy. All right, let's uh, talk a little bit about tooling should always work, right? Uh, yeah, so, um, so there's a couple of examples here, by the way, uh, we, we, we will talk about, uh, which is, uh, for, we, this is the journey we went through at Harness, right? Number one was we were using Jenkins for Harness CI. And I'll actually, in a second, uh, talk about the issues we had with Jenkins and why had we had to move to another solution we built, right? The second was also the custom feature flag solution we were using, uh, which was pretty rudimentary to we had to actually use, uh, you know, again, a production grade, really enterprise class a feature flag solution and how that impacted us as well. These were both big decisions and, uh, you, you know, we, yeah, it, it really improved our ability. And you'll, as you'll see in some of the metrics I showcase later. First, what was broken with Jenkins? Okay, I, there were quite a few things. I, let me highlight the top things. Number one thing was difficulties in troubleshooting. When something went wrong with Jenkins, we needed that special team we had to jump in and really figure it out. It's not like any developer could jump in there and figure out what was going on. Uh, that was very, uh, so that doesn't scale. That means that you have to grow this organization that specifically takes care of your Jenkins. Uh, as your team grows, right? And that just basically means you're sort of linearly adding resources to it, which is not very efficient, okay? Uh, the maintenance overhead was high. Uh, the team size dealing with this was fairly reasonable, right? It was it was a significant percentage of our engineering org. By that, I mean, it's still in single digits, but it's significant in the, in the sense that it's not directly adding value to our customers, okay? Uh, the, there was that. Um, and uh, f f finally, there's, you know, the, the build cycles were really long, the test cycles were long, there were no real obvious ways of optimizing in it, right? Uh, and uh, really importantly also was that governance was a big deal. We just could not mandate every pipeline had to have all these steps. We could not mandate approval stages properly. And so it just basically uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, forced us to, uh, you know, basically be looking at it manually every single day versus hoping that this, the tooling would help us automate some of these best practices. Okay. Um, so by moving to uh, Harness CI, which is an enterprise product we built ourselves and we actually shipped this to others, we, we actually uh, sort of figured, you know, overcame many of these issues. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about what was broken with our custom feature flag solution. So this is another uh, interesting uh, example. We had our own uh, custom feature flags and actually worked pretty well, I would say, until we were about 75 people, right? Uh, because we knew exactly who had access to it. It was just two or three people. So if you needed to know, hey, which if this customer has access to this particular feature, you just send that person an email or a Slack message and that person will say, let me take a look. And if it turns out it's, uh, you know, if they're past their bedtime, maybe just wait for a few hours and they'll respond in the morning, right? Uh, the minute we started growing to, to five products and 200 people, this started breaking, right? Now we were too dependent on one or two people to do this. Uh, and the, then we overreacted to it and gave access to a lot more people to do this. But then we didn't have proper, uh, you know, our back controlling who, who could do what. And so we, we, we released features that should not have been released or we were struggling with figuring out who had access to what, right? Um, and basically the right people didn't have the right visibility or the right power. Right. Uh, finally, uh, we decided that, you know, we have to solve this problem for ourselves and everybody. So we actually sort of built our feature flags uh, product uh, and uh, addressed a lot of these uh, issues. 
Yeah. Uh, and also as the benefit side benefit of this was also that, you know, we actually could follow complex workflows for actually releasing a feature, uh, not just basically turn it on or off, right? You could actually do a rollout, a gradual rollout. Uh, you could figure out exactly the geography you could roll this out to or a specific user or whatever it be. Okay. I am, I'll, I'll pause here for any other questions, uh, if there's any. Um, for a second or two, and then we can move. Okay, all right. Let's, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, how do we get visibility into all the feature flags that are being, excellent question, right? So this is uh, just, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to advertise a specific product or so, but uh, if you look at some of the commercial uh, offerings for feature flags, uh, what they do is they have SDKs, uh, which help you publish the specific feature flags you're using. And also you can go to the GUI and really look at the list of these, uh, the features that are all present and who it has been released, right? And uh, the thing is, the most important thing is you can control who sees this. And you can also sort of control which feature flags, uh, who has the power to change certain feature flags, right? And also uh, who has the power to roll this further or roll this back and things like that. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, please type any follow-on questions and we'll take it uh, in a second there. Right, um, so let's talk a little bit of removing inefficiency. And here's a couple of uh, examples, okay. Um, okay, there's another anonymous identity that has a question. Do Kubernetes-based system need feature flags? Absolutely, everybody needs feature flags. Uh, the, the, in fact, Kubernetes is just infrastructure. Feature flags is what goes into your application, right? For example, uh, let's take something really basic. Let's say you're, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, let, let me take, think of a good example. Let's say you're talk, talking of TurboTax, okay? Let's say they roll out a new feature that sort of helps you, uh, uh, you, you know, sort of, sort of helps you plan your retirement better, right? Uh, Kubernetes cannot help with that, right? Well, what you need to think about is your users and how you're going to roll out features to your users. I mean, then who has control over that? Okay, uh, if that makes sense, right? Uh, let's see, there's another uh, follow-up question. Uh, can you build multiple images from each client and deploy deploy in their tenants? Uh, okay, so uh, I'm not sure what, uh, okay, what that question actually means. Uh, so, but the, uh, uh, okay, if you can elaborate whether you're talking about uh, if you can give a little more context on this, maybe I can help answer this question. Okay, uh, thank you. We'll take it in a second, right? Let me cover this slide meanwhile. Uh, so um, the time to, uh, let's talk a, a little bit about uh, the migration to Bazel that we had to do, right? So we actually used to use Maven for our uh, uh, test and build systems. And uh, if you really look, this is an actual, uh, uh, you know, graph of uh, uh, all the how long it actually took for us to run all of our different types of tests. And these are taken data points taken once every month over a four month period, right? And if you really look, or the time it took for most of our tax tests almost doubled or tripled in in each of these cases, right? And the reason for that was our team grew uh, a lot uh, during that period. And also, uh, you know, we were adding new services and new tests associated with it. And one of the things with Maven is you can't pick and choose. Uh, when you're running uh, like in a mono repo, you can't pick and choose what uh, you know, builds and tests you are, you are specifically running for each developer, right? And so what we did was by moving to Bazel, we were sort of forced to create a dependency graph and people could just, uh, when they make code changes, we were only building the necessary parts of it using a global cache for everything else. And also uh, the tests were associated with the specific component that you were building. Okay, uh, that's great, but that's not sufficient. What if you just made like, you know, five line change, which only really affects one test, even within the specific service, right? And for each of our services, the tests take anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes, right? How do you, how do, you do that? Uh, and the, the, uh, for that, what, what we did is we, we used something called test intelligence. And let me sort of walk you guys through how this fits into the whole process. Now, this is how a typical PR process looks like, right? Uh, a developer basically goes, creates a local working branch, creates a pull request on it, uh, right? Uh, so, sorry, that starts, uh, starts coding and then put, creates a pull request on it, finally goes through the review process. When they're going through this review process, 
Uh, what they do is obviously they had the changes, they sent it for review, they get feedback, they make changes, they go do a build again, and then a test cycle again, and then submit the review again. And they might get more feedback, again, code changes, build and test. So what we found out was on for, for Harness, we do about 700 odd PRs per month, pull requests per month. And for each PR, we actually do 3.5 PR checks for merge, which is if you look at the cycle of code changes, build and test, we repeat that about 3.5 times for each PR. Okay. Um, and so that resulted in about 2.5 thousand, uh, you know, PR checks a month, right? Uh, and basically the thing, what we, uh, what, what, what were we doing with test intelligence? Let me walk through that in a, a little bit in detail here. So what we do here is we instrument, dynamically instrument our code to figure out what is the exact set of tests that impact the specific change you made to your code. Okay, like for example, if you change only one line of code and there's only one test that covers that, we will be able to figure that, right? So if you had like a hundred unit test, we would only run that one instead of the hundred. Okay, uh, so when uh, so the, so what we found out was once we started using this module, what we call test intelligence, we found out that uh, the number of test runs saving with uh, TI, we were saving about thirty five percent time. Uh, in the amount of tests we, uh, you know, we did, we had we could avoid running uh, if we with test intelligence, right? And if you let's look at the little bit about the math, which means that, uh, you know, if the average test time without test intelligence was forty three minutes, uh, right? And if we saved thirty five percent time, what we found out based on the thirty five percent saving was that we were saving three point five percent years every in a calendar year with test intelligence. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, uh, let, me, let me try and answer this question here. Uh, there's a question, Kubernetes systems are deployed based on container images and let's say they're deployed in multi-tenancy with their isolated environments, okay? Can you build an image specific to a customer requiring only modules they're supposed to have instead of a single system with massive feature flags and figuring out uh, what features are deployed for each client? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, uh, what, what this really comes down to is, uh, yes, if you're doing more of an on-prem solution, this seems like you could make it work. But if you're a SaaS solution and it's sort of shared between tens of customers, uh, which is what a lot of people do, uh, it sort of makes sense to uh, basically use feature flags, uh, right? Uh, thanks for clarifying your previous question. And also, I really think that you should plan for scale. Uh, yeah, like what's being described here to use Kubernetes uh, and images to uh, do this isolation, I think works better on a sort of smaller scale. Uh, but really, ultimately, you have managing the features is the bigger problem, not how you achieve it, right? Uh, so you could uh, technically use a different mechanism, but how you manage those feature flags on top is the most important part, right? And uh, if you uh, basically by doing it at the infrastructure level or, or the image level, I would say it just becomes really, uh, it actually, I would say at scale becomes extremely complicated. You really have to know what's working. And if you have to debug, it becomes really, really hard. Versus, uh, yes, your code might look a little more clunky with feature flag SDK is built into it. Uh, but if you figure out a good mechanism to do it or a good system to do it, uh, it becomes much more readable. And also, uh, I, I think uh, the amount of time you'll spend debugging uh, at, you know, any, anything more than 100 users will reduce dramatically. Okay. Thanks for the question. That was a great question. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let's talk a little bit about how we uh, actually measure and look for bottlenecks as well. Okay. Uh, so these are actual real examples of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of some of the metrics uh, we, we, we look at at uh, Harness, right? So look at, just look at our uh, deployment frequency. This is from the past week. This is pretty much, I would say the same, even if you go back a few months. Um, uh, on some days we do over hundred plus deployments. It, again, as I said, you really need to look at your business function uh, and just decide what is the deployment frequency you need to have. The reason we have so many deployments is we have a number of services, we have a number of products uh, that uh, you know, we ship. Uh, and they're all deploy independently. And that basically is what, what highlights this, right? Uh, but if you look at uh, the ability to uh, also change, like some days it's lower, some days it's higher. It's just the most important thing is, do you have the ability to do this? Okay, that's, uh, that's part one. Uh, the second thing, 
here is uh, that if you see uh, October 16th, 17th, that happened to be the weekend. So nothing much there. Uh, if you look at 15th, that's uh, thanks to uh, some of our awesome execs at Harness. We actually have the second Friday off every month. Uh, and uh, this is in addition to other holidays, right? And so it's just uh, beautiful that we get the day off. And uh, so our, you know, our uh, deployment frequency was much lower that day, but it's still surprising that we are 10 plus deployments even on, on an off day. Okay. Uh, so this is something I think we're extremely proud of on how, uh, how smoothly this part works for our organization. Okay. Now, actually, let's look at something that probably the number is not where you think it should be, the change failure. If you look, we are at 25%. Typically, when you talk of an elite organization, you're talking less than 15%. So it's really important you have dashboards like this to figure out exactly where the problems are. So if somebody told me you have a 25% median failure rate, the first my first reaction is, but why, right? And immediately you jump into a report like this uh, and I can see, hey, can I sort uh, by the list of projects that actually have the highest deployment failure rate? And immediately you can see where the problem is, right? In this case, if you see most of our, uh, the most of the projects with the highest deployment failure rate were actually test projects in our case, right? Which is fine, uh, it was great. And they're actually probably not even deploying to production. Okay, uh, we were quickly able to figure this problem out and say, that's fine. I think this is something we can ignore and like maybe for a future dashboard, we can just, uh, you know, not uh, put this uh, sort of, uh, you know, remove these, uh, filter these projects out so that we only look at the ones that really matter to us. Okay. Right. Finally, um, how long does it take for you to do the deployment itself? Right. Um, now, this is, you're really looking for anomalies here. Like if you look at this graph, clearly we have, uh, there's actually, I think, two projects here that have this 24 hour thing where we really run the deployment for an extremely long period of time, like it's almost a day, and then it fails, uh, right? Uh, so you know that something is wrong with these two projects, okay? But if you look at everything else, and if you look at the mean, data, mean duration, it's, it's uh, really good. It's less than 30 minutes for us to do a deployment, right? So it immediately helps us focus on where, which projects are the problem areas, can work with the team leaders, and they can just go fix this themselves, okay? Um, Finally, we should, uh, I talked about cost, right? Like a few times here. And this is extremely important uh, that everybody should pay attention to this because this is the runaway train that can derail all your projects, okay? Um, in our case, our logging cost was pretty high. It was, and it was increasing significantly, okay? And, uh, so I don't have this graph for more than the period uh, here, which is for like a quarter, uh, right? But basically what it was is that this had been all growing slowly over the last year. And so we uh, we looked into this. Uh, this is our logging cost, uh, you know, and GCP. And we looked into this and we said we have to take care of this. This is this is disproportionately high for what we are doing, right? And somewhere in August we started working on it, uh, and you know, you can see a trend downwards from there on on how we are addressing this. So. Um, again, to summarize, I think uh, looking at these metrics, extremely important. This is how you know what is wrong. This is how you identify bottlenecks. This, and uh, just please make sure that you're building systems that actually allow you to measure and identify these bottlenecks. So then you can do the other things I talked about. Like in our case, we moved to Bazel or we built test intelligence. These are all efficiencies we gained after realizing what was wrong with our process. Okay. Um, that concludes my... A presentation. Um, I'm I'm here to answer any questions um, from here on. Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, there's some good question here. Is there a good resource to better understand correlation between different metrics? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an extremely good question. So it depends on, again, which part you're, uh, you're, you're, you're talking about. So let, let me give you a couple of examples, okay? Um, so one is, one if you, if you look at uh, the uh, deployment verification part of our product, which is called continuous verification, what we really try to do is we really try to help map 
between uh, you know like the specific change that you were doing, for example, a deployment or whether you did an infrastructure related change, and point out to specific failure and show you the correlation between them. That might be one way you can correlate the metrics, right? Um, uh, and um, uh, you, you know, typically these are pretty hard to do. Uh, exactly what is wrong. I think the key thing here is change related to specific metric not going right is possibly the the thing that is uh, that's the best way to correlate things, right? Versus just correlating different metrics together, uh, right? Because what you're really trying to do at the end of the day is root cause why yes some metric is not where it should be for you. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Uh, I'll take the next question. Uh, what are you currently working on to, uh, towards uh, uh, in terms of roadmap? Yeah, we're doing, uh, there's a lot of stuff. I, I can't completely talk about everything, but um, so I think the, as a company, I, I, would, I, would, I would basically say what we are focused on is uh, we want to do everything in the software delivery space, which means everything from the point you write code to putting it in production and making sure it works as you expect in production. Right. Uh, so anything in the realm of it is what we do. Uh, one of the differences between us and I would say uh, what's out there uh, from a competitor standpoint is that we are a deep company. We don't want to build something because it's supposed to be there. When we pick a project, we really want to make sure we are addressing uh, really strong pain points and our offering is actually differentiated against the best in that segment. For example, if you look at uh, continuous integration, we incorporated test intelligence into that. Uh, if you look at feature flags, we are incorporating the end-to-end -end pipeline into that, right? If you look at cloud costs, we focus on Kubernetes. Nobody was doing that well when we started, right? So we don't want to do any shallow pro projects, but yeah, if that helps you answer yeah, the question. Okay. Um, what, what was the biggest return on investment for Harness as you looked at these metrics of scale? What would you, uh, where would you first look first in your opinion? Yeah, I think the, the ability to look at all the metrics I just showed, especially in the end, I think that was huge. Uh, really having those metrics, knowing how your deployment frequency was going, that was a really big deal. The second investment I would say is moving away from Jenkins was a really big deal uh, because it really lifted the spirit of an, our engineering organization because we had been hearing constant pain over uh, like I would say 18 months on how we were unable to scale and uh, just people being extremely frustrated uh, about that. Uh, that. That would be the second one I would say was a really big deal for us. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Harness provides integrations with third-party services like GitLab. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, we integrate with pretty much anybody. Like we are a platform, but uh, yeah, absolutely, <clears throat> we do. Uh, at Harness, do you have metrics you track directly against individual engineers, or do you, do you stay at the team level? So, uh, yeah, great question, Sean. So we actually do have metrics even at individual engineers, but we don't use that for day-to-day -day, uh, operations. And the reason, uh, the reason we don't do that is because I don't think they're that useful. Uh, it, 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 it is in very rare circumstances very useful. Let me give you examples. Um, if you look, different engineers bring different things to the table, uh, right? And there are some, some engineers, what we call, are really good at design. There are some engineers that are really good at collaborating. And there are some en engineers who are just really good at producing code. Okay, we can't measure everybody at the same time. Thing. And some of these are not quantitative measures, they are qualitative measures. So I don't think that's really that important. I think measuring at the organization level and looking at uh, the inefficiencies in the system is more important than uh, you know, measuring at the individual level, if that answered the question. <laughs> okay, uh, I think we have a few more minutes, so I'm just uh, going to hang around here, uh, if that's okay, Marisa, for a few more minutes to answer questions. Oh, there you go. Okay, uh, great, great question here uh, again uh, once more. So it is, uh, can you use uh, Harness with GitHub Actions and how do you uh, deal with overlap? Yeah, so we actually connect very well. So you can use any CI solution with our continuous delivery or our continuous verification, our feature flags product uh, that works pretty well. On the other hand, you could just be using GitHub SCM and you can use our CI solution. Right. The way we, if you were to use GitHub Actions, is uh, you know we we actually have all sort of trigger events where you can tell us when an artifact has been generated, and we can basically take it from there and help you with the rest of the deployment. Uh, but yes, we 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 actually integrate really well into most SCM and other CI solutions out there.
Uh, there's a question from Taha. Uh, how can we make action process and get failure of process? Um, I actually not sure I got the question. Uh, uh, apologize for that. If you could uh, clarify that, I would appreciate it. Okay, any, any other questions here or clarification to the previous question? Ah, how do you deal with rollbacks? Uh, excellent question again. So I think uh, the way we, the, there's two things uh, here. So one is uh, the, the the rollback strategy actually uh, really depends on the app. You need to provide how you would do the rollback. But what we have what we have developed is a system to automatically figure out whether a rollback should be initiated. Right. So for example, I, I was just giving you the example of page load times. It could be any metric you care about. So. We, we monitor those metrics over a period of time and sort of create a baseline on how your app behaves. So when you go ahead and start rolling out a new, new uh, artifact or even start rolling out a new feature, we start looking at those metrics uh, in context of when you did it and start seeing whether those metrics deviate from a well-known baseline. If they do, uh, we automatically initiate a rollback. If they don't, we automatically initiate a roll forward. So uh, what we can help with and what we do internally ourselves is basically that level of automation, right? But how you do the rollback is something uh, like the steps you need to do the rollback is de definitely depends on the app and has to be taken care of by the application owner. Yes. Okay, uh, thanks uh, Taha for uh, clarifying your question. Yes, absolutely. So I think uh, you, uh, you, 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 you can, there's a lot of actions you can take on, on the CI CD pipeline, right? At different stages and on different events. And it doesn't even need to be a failure. You can just define the, the, the uh, event in which you would like to trigger a failure response. Uh, right or, any, or a notification response for that matter or an approval uh, step. Uh, for that matter, right? You can do all this and uh, yes, all of these integrate on Slack uh, and you can basically uh, act on either an approval or a failure or even a success case, whatever it be uh, on Slack or some of the other tools. I mean, we have pretty deep integrations with a number of other tools out there, including Jira. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, give, uh, can you give more examples of key engineering metrics you can get transparency to? Yeah, so I think uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of metrics, right? So the, the, uh, see, see, the thing is, there's two sides, I would say. There's sort of this line, which is, hey, how is the team doing in terms of productivity? And the second is, how well are they doing from the point that code has been produced to how it goes to production? And what is the quality of the code that goes in? Okay, so the first the case I talked about, it's the former case, is all about the agile metrics, right? We're looking at the agile metrics. We are seeing, hey, how, how, how many tickets is the team able to take? What's the size of these tickets, right? We don't want to measure against different teams. Uh, that's not correct because, you know, how you size tickets really varies per team. What you, would, what you can look at is the velocity of the team over time and see how they're doing because they have a certain system and, um, you, you, you know, and within the team, you compare it uh, to the team itself, like how they have been doing in the past, right? And so that those are important metrics to see the productivity of the team, right? And then I also talked about people metrics, extremely important, uh, just, just basically measure their engagement. Uh, you know, for example, uh, we, we use a survey tool, uh, we, which really tell, gives us like into the, these insights every month. Right? So those are all really important uh, metrics that we measure to figure out how efficient our team is and also how happy they're. Now, the second part is where we focused on today, which is once the code is generated, what does it take for it to go into production? And how, how, how much time is it taking? What are the issues we are running into? Okay, uh, hopefully that answered your question.
Okay, just uh, waiting for some more questions. Um, maybe give it a few minutes. Yep, there it is. Okay, uh, John from Jonathan. Is it a good practice to assign symbolic values to each metric? For example, each, for each job failure or deployment done, company lost certain money. Yeah, this is, uh, this is an excellent question, Jonathan. Um, I think, and by the way, this is a pretty debated uh, question as well. So a lot of times, I mean, uh, let, let's look at it the other way which is, can we assign a dollar value for every commit that a developer does, right? And the answer, what we found to that is, it's not simple because typically, if you look at the per commit basis, you cannot really figure out what is the impact because two commits together are probably worth 10x more than what each commit would have been worth by themselves, right? So, so I think, uh, 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 abstracting it a little higher, especially at like a service level or a product level helps a lot more, uh, right? Versus going down to each comment or each failure, okay? Uh, again, like uh, I think failure is, uh, in, the, in case of failure, it's a little easier to assign it, uh, but the, the dollar amount to it. But even then I would, I would basically say, uh, yeah, you know, I would basically say uh, that the right way to do this is look at how much, what was the downtime you had in a given quarter and really associate the money lost from that point of view versus a specific failure. Because it's really hard. Like maybe you lost a customer just because of one failure or maybe you lost customer because you have a lot more downtime in a quarter, right? I would say the latter is more likely, which is people get frustrated when you have repeated failures versus a single failure. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, another question from Taha, uh, any AI and ML at, in Harness? Yes, we, we do use AI and ML for our uh, uh, continuous verification product, which is the deployment verification I just uh, I talked about in the slides, uh, right? Uh, that, is, that is how we figure out whether your metrics are, uh, you know, sort of not following the pattern that they were following in the past. We, we learn and build a mathematical model using ML and, um, you know, so sort of compare against that to figure out uh, whether uh, your deployment is going well or not. Okay. Um, uh, supporting programming languages. Yeah, I think, I mean, CI, we are agnostic to programming languages. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, just, uh, yes, we do support those. Okay. Uh, okay, another question. Uh, what have you seen uh, to have made the biggest impact on your teams in your journey, building the platform and dog footing so far? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, I think I just mentioned this. I think the Jenkins thing was a really big deal. Uh, I think it made a huge impact. The second thing we are seeing uh, making an impact is also the test intelligence part of it. Um, so even in our very first version, we are saving 35% time for our developers on average. So we are very conservative. If we cannot figure out whether we can uh, we can run only a specific number of tests, we just run everything. Okay. So. So basically, there's lots of runs where we are running everything, but the runs we don't run everything. We really save people, our team, a lot of time. For example, instead of running 100 unit tests, we only run one or two, and it happens quite a bit. And that's how they end up saving 35% time. So that has, uh, you know, I, I, in my opinion, really encouraged our engineers uh, a lot. Uh, you know, it, it just they just feel good about how fast they can move and not context switch every time they go through a PR check process. Um, that's one more thing. So on, uh, I would say even on the feature flags uh, side of things, uh, especially a product management team is extremely happy about it, uh, right? They really feel that the visibility and the control they have uh, is so much better than what they had before. Uh, from the engineering side, I would say, sure, they're, they're, I think that they're happy it's uh, you know more systematic than what was there before. Uh, but uh, I think it's mainly the big impact is on the product side and, and the customer success side. Okay, guys, let's uh, give it one more round of questions, uh, I guess. Okay. Perfect. Looks like uh, we we are uh, okay. We are done. 
Um, awesome. Thank you so much, folks, for the awesome questions. Oh, there's one more question. Let me take this. Okay. Uh, can we integrate multiple clouds like uh, AWS, uh, Azure? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, great, guys. Uh, thank you so much uh, for attending the webinar. It was a pleasure uh, to, to take all the, uh, the wonderful questions from, uh, from the team. Uh, I look forward to more webinars like this. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you, Srinivas, for your time today. Thank you, everyone. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. Okay. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day, everyone.